I'd like to take you through a case study that I developed based on um, work we've done here at GASIS and published in PLUS One. The article is open access and it's provided for in your packets and it's also available for you. It should be digitally as an, as a, as an online article in your data state, but if not, you can always go to the PLUS One website. So in this lecture, I'd like to introduce the problem of documenting variable harmonization and the solution we've come up with, why you should care about documentation, the metadata that we use in charm stats that uh, Paula will demonstrate later, including study, question, and variable level data, metadata. We're going to look at an example from the comparative study of electoral systems and the British election study when we wanted to harmonize a marital status variable in the two studies. And in terms of the review for the documentation, that's the citation that you can use. Um, all right, I'm going to just let me go ahead and see if there's a. I should probably tell a little bit of the story before we get too far. Yeah. So the story behind this case study, when we go uh, along, is that the comparative study of electoral systems asks a series of standardized questions in election studies in North America as well as in Europe and other places in the world. The British election study is one nation's version of that. In 2005, the team unilaterally made a decision to take all of the comparative study of electoral system questions out of the main face-to-face, -face, no, it was, in, it was in the mailbag survey. And they put it into their internet pilot. They were doing, for the first time, a face-to-face -face and internet version of the electoral, of the election study. Um, and they put the CSES questions in the, elect, in the internet version rather than in the mailback version, which had some advantages. The mailback had a smaller uh, pool of respondents, so the sample size was smaller, and also the internet data, you could do more quota sampling or try to get a more representative um, sample to work with rather than just who happened to reply back with the survey, um, post-survey form. However, the comparative study of electoral systems as a group had not approved the use of internet surveys for their study. So as a consequence, in 2005 and 2010, the British election study questions, while asked, were not included in the overall data set, in the CSES data set, because they hadn't, the mode of collection was not approved of by the CSES. So what we've done here is do an example of harmonizing the British election study variable of marital status to the comparative study of electoral systems harmonized variable for marital status and how we went about doing that. So that's the overview of this. So we know that comparative statistical analyses require data harmonization, but when it comes to documenting your work and what you've done, there are no agreed documentation standards. Um, journals don't necessarily request this information, and there's no sort of systemized way of recording it or finding it. So here at GASIS, we're proposing a conceptual and data-driven solution to create harmonization documentation standards for both publication and your scholarly citations. And we know that harmonizing data is a routine part of scientific research, um, but when researchers can't find a harmonized structure to replicate, they kind of have to do the best they can, and oftentimes they try to document their work by, say, appending a do file or their SPSS file with their work. And that's good, but it doesn't necessarily provide all the information someone would need to replicate it or understand it. Um, and it's not always the case that they are working with Stata if you give them a do file, or they're working with SPSS if you give them a save file. There are proprietary locks on that documentation. So we wanted to do a couple things as we're innovating ways to document variable harmonization. We wanted to try to set, set some best uh, standards for best practices. We wanted to introduce a concept of peer review for the documentation so that people are, you know, have a similar system to journal articles and find some place where we can deposit it and where people can find it. So as we were aiming to start a conversation about these guidelines and discuss what is necessary and sufficient. And this was the criteria that I came down to. Is what is the necessary information to replicate it or cite it? And what is the sufficient information? We don't, as social, science, as social scientists, have a common theoretical framework. How we choose to 
uh, analyze our data can depend on our needs. So for instance, in sociology, having a really variegated, finely refined education measure might be really important. For me, as a political scientist, I might just be happy with, you know, more than some college and less than some college. So there isn't rules that we can give people in terms of how to harmonize their variables, but we can try to do it encourage them to be transparent and precise about it. We've already seen this transparency quote from the last slide, so I won't go over it again, but again, it's the cornerstone of, of what we're trying to do here. And the way that we get to realize our goal of transparency is through documentation. So why is there this increasing pressure to document? We have more and better data to work with. It's not just like one study that everybody uses and knows the documentation for. We have increasingly sophisticated methods for statistical ma um, analysis that might expand the kinds of data or the ways that we use data. And there might be specific information required to replicate a variable. And that replication, precise replication, is how we advance our theory. So not only is replication key to evaluating a piece of research, it also then should set up people uh, for new research paths in the future. Why isn't it enough to just put your do file in or your syntax file from M plus or SACS or, or SPSS? I touched on this a little bit already. First, there aren't conventions as to how you should present the information. Some people might write notes in their do files. Other people might just put the code. And both right now are fine. You know, you're just happy something was attached, usually. Um, the code itself might not allow you to understand the reasoning. Like what I said with uh, why people would recode, don't know what political party you're closer to, into a no. If you're not a political scientist, you might not really understand why are you capturing all this missing data? Is this really theoretically sound? And having a description or a citation or a rationale with the code would allow people to understand your thinking. And this is sort of, again, just providing the code doesn't tell you how people decided to code things. So with charm stuff, the idea is to reduce the time it takes to assemble the necessary and sufficient metadata in order to replicate or to do harmonization work. It also improves data management by housing all of the information you need and also the, the software generates into the same location. And we also not only have the ability to generate code in SPS and SPS data, but also M plus and SAS. We're working on a proposal to maybe include R and Python in the future, so we'll see if that happens. Um, and by providing this template, we're hoping to be able to give researchers a standard to work for and then to be able to know what to look for in other people's documentation. So hopefully this will facilitate communications not only within the disciplines, but across them. So when it comes to doing this work, the CharmStat software, which stands for the coding and harmonization of statistics, it starts at the conceptual level. We assume that what researchers are going to be engaging with is a concept like education or unemployment or you know, attitudes toward the EU, whatever else. And we know that researchers are the best placed to define their measures according to the theories that they're working with or picking which measures are best, capturing that. So your job as a researcher is to doc, document the creation of your measures um, and maybe talk about the other stuff. Our job as a data archive people is to provide you tools so you can put all that into an organized way and have it up for the world to reuse, reuse or, or consult. We talked in the last lecture about metadata and what it does, and this is a, a, this is a repeat of that to kind of connect again to this idea that metadata and an archive is turned into machine readable so it can be findable and it contains all the information that people should um, need to know about the study in order to evaluate. Was it done properly? When was it done? Who was asked? Who can this data be applying to? We've already seen this DDI slide, so moving forward. Why are we using the Charmstat software? Well, it's in this example, we used it to reduce the amount of time needed to assemble all of the metadata to do the documentation. It houses it all in one place, so you don't have to go searching for it once it's in your database. And third, it provides you with a digital solution rather than a PDF solution. So it makes it easier to find, um, instead of looking through a 300-page PDF for how did they recode Austrian education into you know, the, the educational structure, um, you should be able to do a digital search and pull this information. So how does CharmStats work and how do we organize the information that will be presented in your documentation? 
Well, for each of the variables that you have, it brings in three pieces of, or it connects it to three pieces of information. The study it came from, the question wording that was used as the stimulus, and then all of the information on the variable itself, including its name, its label, the coding, and the coding label. And we use either SPSS or Excel currently is the most efficient ways to import all of this metadata into the TarmStats MySQL database through the interface of the software. Oh, that's not what I want. <laughs> Where's the little, uh, the little beaver? Does it have a little light? Okay, there we go, um, yes. So we use, um, by opening up the software and then pulling in either Excel templates that have the metadata, or by pulling up the um, SPSS data, unfortunately, is proprietary. And so we have to pay to like have the way to transfer from directly from Stata into MySQL. So we have to do everything through uh, my, um, SPSS because it's free. So that's why we use SPSS, because it's free. But we use that to basically do a mass import where we treat the question label in SPSS or in Excel as the question level variable, we add the study information and all the variables imported from that study are connected to that study level information and uh, so we have everything connected in the software. So once it's in your MySQL database, you can fetch it in order to put together information in the projects. You have your variable level and question level and study level metadata all connected as far as the database are concerned. If you pick one piece of information, they're going to take everything else along with it in terms of tracking what you're using inside the software. And then as you work with the harmonization, um, you can recode things and you create a new project. And as you'll see, that will create an output. When we did the article on the marital status variable, I haven't forgotten, we are going to come back to that. Um, we had to, or I had to ask, what is the information that is most, that's necessary and sufficient to do a replication? And so we determined that the following metadata were needed in order for someone else to replicate it. That's the name of the project or the study and its authors, so you know where to find the work and that it, we check the, the funding, make sure it's all reputable. You need the code for the recoding language in whatever language it's offered. You need information on what the purpose of the harmonization was. And you also need to identify which concept you're harmonizing. These are pretty basic, necessary things to know moving forward. We also um, put information in, we, have, we think what's required is target and source variable metadata, the wording metadata, and the study metadata. So that's basically like information you need to describe the harmonization and then the metadata you need to document what you used and what you did to it. Those are all kind of digitally put into the software for you through the importation process. But then as the user, you ultimately are the person who decides how to harmonize things. So you create the project where you bring in your target variable and your source variables um, and give it a name so it can be organized. Um, and then this information, the variable metadata, um, is imported automatically through the software. The variable name, the variable label, the values, the value labels, and also the measurement level. So you know if it's a nominal measure or an ordinal measure or an aggregate level measure. All of this is included in the interface. The purpose of adding all this information is so that at the end of the project, when you've harmonized your source variable to your target variable and you click report, the software will auto-generate a report and it will fetch all the information you tell it you tell the software you want to display. So in this case you can see we have the target name and label. The sampling level is individual level. It's a nominal level measure. The question wording in this is the CSES is harmonized data set. So it's not question wording because they didn't ask the question, but the concept is the respondent's marital status or civil union status. And then this is their harmonized structure. So we have all the information we need in terms of what the CSES harmonized marital variable metadata is. With the British, in the case of the British study, we have basically the same information, except instead of a label in the question source metadata information, we actually have a question. The wording that was given to the respondents through the internet. What is your marital status? Are you? And then they're offered the, the options, and you can see what they are behind me. 
I also put some notes in here in terms of like where the question wording could be found at the time the study wasn't deposited with the UK Data Archive. So you could only find the data and copies of the questionnaire on the study's website. So I included that in the references so that people would know where to go to get access to the original study and the original documentation. Um, on, the, on the question level, we have uh, metadata on the question wording, including multiple languages. The software was recently updated to be a Unicode database so it can handle Cyrillic as well as Roman letters. And we would suggest that not only would you include the question wording, but if there was interviewer instructions, or if you have an example or the text of the show card, this might also be something you'd want to document. There might be other information that was given to the interviewers that might be important, but there's space in the software to document all of these things. So here's an example of the question level metadata. And this, in this case is from the religious denomination variable in the European Value Survey from 2017. You can see that they have here the project name, which is religious denomination in the EBS of 2017. There's then a summary description of what it's measuring. They have a question wording there. And then they also have a, co a concept description, which is where they lay out their rationale for their education, I'm sorry, their religious denomination metric. So all of this is actually generated automatically, once you write it into a project, it's automatically generated every time you produce a report. And then finally, the study information, the name, version, where it can be found with its persistent identifier, who funded it, collectors, all of these sorts of things. So in our case, we had the British Election Study. I didn't have an archive, DOI, so I included the, the website. Um, more information about the collection dates, the sample size, um, who collected it in order to be, try to be transparent. So as I said, the BES data weren't collected in the approved mode for the comparative study of electoral systems. And we used the Charmstat software to create a publishable harmonization project that researchers could use to combine these two data sets together. And of course, we want to make sure that these cross-national measures are um, comparable. So in terms of the output harmonization, if you guys remember, it, you assess the data at the collection level. We know there's a problem with these data. One was collected on the internet, one was collected on face-to-face. -face. But for some researchers, they might not care. You know, so we'll leave that up to the researcher, um, assessing them at the measurement level and then documenting the process of harmonization. I'm going to skip these a little bit because we've done some of this. All right. So when it came to actually harmonizing marital status in the British election study to the CSES, it was not a one-to-one -one case. We actually had to make uh, the, we consulted with the comparative study of electoral systems, one member of staff, who's my co-author on this, uh, Sebastian Netcher. And I said, Sebastian, if this wasn't internet data, how would you recall this? <laughs> and then he told me, and that's what we did. Uh, but as you can see, the software allows you to designate information as missing, so we handle missing data as a separate category of invalid data, just like you would the software package. And then the way that we have this set up is this is the target variable over here, the C2004. This is the CSES. Here on this side, we have Q161. That's the British election study. And as you can see, the, the process of creating a project and recoding not only allows us to auto-generate the code in multiple languages, it gives us the ability to, then to basically auto-generate a graph like this. So if you wanted to demonstrate seven different ways of harmonizing different variables to different target variables, or seven different source variables to a single target variable, you could actually generate these kinds of graphs to show where categories were collapsing, where you might be losing information, or you can just do this to make sure your coding turned out right. Sometimes when you're working with the software, I know from our team, some countries have like 17 different educational variables <laughs> or educational categories because they've done, they've reorganized their educational system a couple times in the last few decades. And then it's really easy to maybe miss when you recoded one of them wrong. But by generating these graphs, it's very easy to see. If you know what's supposed to be coded, you can check it very quickly. This was also auto-generated as a consequence of putting the information on the variable question and study into CharmStats. We generated this report at the end, and 
The thing about the report generator is that it's a blank template. You can reorder the information and how it's pulled. So in this case, we thought, well, researchers are quite interested in the recoding text, less in the story about which study it was and the question wording, because they're stuck with the questions from BES. They can't change them, so let's just move on. We decided to give the project name, the most prominent place, the submission and publication date, the authors, and then we provide the syntax in both SPSS and Stata. So that's how we set up our sample report in this case. So if you were coming along and you had the BES data set and you had the CES data set, but no harmonized data set with both of them existed, you should be able to put them together, run this code, and now your data set is ready, at least as far as the marital status um, variable is concerned, and you can do more comparative election study analysis now with the British data as opposed to excluding it. In terms of the project notes, we describe what the purpose of the harmonization is. We, give, we also give here a definition of marital status because, you know, if you think about it, um, a marital status question could be, are you married or not? But that's not what we ask. We actually ask cohabitation questions, not marital status. So in the British case, you can see they treat living together as married, as married. But that's not a marital state. You know, so it's a, there's a little bit of conceptual fudging here going on. You know, um, insofar as you could turn this into a theoretically justifiable dichotomous variable, but you'd lose a lot of obviously categorical information by doing this. However, um, it's not technically a marital status question. It's bigger than that. And living together as married or um, married but living apart, married but separated. You know, those are, that's another, I think, category that the British asks. And again, it's not about there being a right or wrong recoding, it's about being transparent and letting people know why you did what you did. So that they can either decide, that's a good idea, or ah, I'm not going to do it. In so that was basically, these are the standards we think are necessary. If you read the full article, again, it should be available here in your packet. And these are the things that we propose are the necessary and sufficient things to document in order for someone else to come along and read your work, understand your decision making, and replicate it, and build on it if they want to. So the final thing that we offer is to adapt current citation guidelines so that we have a standard for actually citing harmonized work. If you go through all of the bother of assembling all of this metadata and putting it into a really nice digital you know, a report or a code book, and you want people to be able to find it and read it and cite you. So we've taken a version of an electronic document citation and just adapted it to things that were similar for archive stuff. So we would say, you know, last name, the name of the project, um, what it is, where it was published, in what year, and when it was last accessed, as well as the DOI. So it's not that complicated, but if you go to look up how do I document variable harmonization in the APA, it won't exist. So we, we tried to fill that gap. What are your questions? <laughs> um, yeah, so Yannick, there's the article itself is in here, right? In the data harmonization one? So I'm sorry, I'm going to pop this up in here. Yes, it's very small font. My apologies. Uh, for I know it's here though, but I know it's the older, I need you know, bigger font. But for the purposes of saving paper, um, we did also give you this hard copy of it as well. So if you wanted to read through it, there's more details on the actual the study itself, and you can see some of the outputs in you know, full form. But uh, certainly you should make this, you know, feel free to reproduce this for your students or um, use it in any way that you find. Thank you.